I'm doing lots of music, more music than I imagine I would be doing it. Describe this kind of a situation to me. Been doing uh, uh, music at home for our sunset concerts, uh, live stream for a special uh, experimental broadcast test group. I've been doing um, remixes and collaborations over the web. So I haven't been going out, no touring, no outdoor performances. Why were you skeptical early on that you might not be making that much music during this time period? Obviously, you've got a lot of free time now. Yeah, lots of free time. I thought it would be just a lot of free time since all engagements were canceled and um, performance spaces didn't seem real because of uh, social distancing. So I just let, let it go that I would be making music. And suddenly the, the new norms showed up in its face that I'd, I'd be working out of home. And my home studio is pretty much capable of handling medium to uh, mid professional assignments recording. Are you somebody who requires a, a collaborator? You're not somebody who just sort of sits down and, and, and tinkers musically on your own? I do a lot of solo, one person orchestral kind of work. But um, artists who are finishing up recording projects have asked if I would donate, collaborate, or remix some one track on their project before they complete it. So that's been a new wave of delightful fun. What is, what is a solo music making experience like for you? I mean, obviously, you've been playing a lot of piano recently. Yes, yeah, solo, it, it's, I'm able to uh, access intuitive my intuitive spontaneity and shift at a moment's notice. And uh, my score would be an inner score, imagination, feeling, sometimes just spontaneous free association with uh, the note that I played before. So it's also, uh, it's aligned with my spiritual practice of being in the present moment. Being in the moment, I feel an intimate communion with the whole cosmos the creative present time. Generally, when people describe your music, you know, it's obviously there's uh, ambience or um, they'll use words like, like new age, but do you consider yourself to be part of the jazz tradition? I've been influenced by jazz and I like to improvise and imitate what I consider to be jazz artists or jazz feelings. But I haven't rose up to declare myself a jazz artist. Um, Maybe freeform, experimental. I have fun at the keyboard. I like playing with harmonies and rhythms. And someone else might say, hey, that's jazz. I just, next to people that I've considered great jazz artists, I haven't decided to take that label on. You feel like jazz is just kind of too grandiose of a title that you're comfortable bestowing upon yourself? Well, the jazz I've been exposed to is an artist who seem to uh, have very deep, study on jazz chords and rhythms and approaches to it and I have never done that studied with a jazz teacher or haven't studied chords my feeling is intuitive so I haven't studied a book of jazz chords or I haven't done what I thought was the traditional route of becoming a, an official jazz performer you have studied music though you went to school for music what kind of music were you playing at the time it was classically oriented, Eastern classical, Western classical music, um, orchestral, choral, piano, solo, but more of the staid uh, Western classical form. I was never given a course in jazz piano or jazz rhythms or jazz harmonies. I just kind of intuitively inch my way into that world. At the time, did you consider yourself to be a, a part of that canon, of the, the kind of Western classical canon? Uh, my studies took me there and I could resonate with um, the music. It touched me and I imagine it imprinted me in such a way that I reach for that expression in my either piano works, my piano improvisations, along with uh, rock, jazz, R&B, if I sat down on a keyboard, I would probably go through a wide range of influences without trying to isolate myself into one of them. The classical music I was exposed to came through Howard University and also high school, choir music, orchestral music. I played violin and orchestra and 
high school. So I was exposed to classical directions and music. And uh, I guess I kind of emulate that in the way that I approach the piano in general. Did you envision yourself as, you know, potentially having a career being a part of an orchestra or, you know, touring around playing some of these kinds of music? Uh, Brian, that's close to it. I imagined that I would be composing music for orchestras. After college, moving to New York, I realized that I would have to get an orchestra together, pay them, rehearse them. And I said, yo, <laughs> that might not happen as easy as I thought. The synthesizers offered me a hope though, that synthesizers, I could sit down with my keyboard and pull up oboe and cellos and flutes and create an orchestral sound through synthesizers. And that would allow me to do something that I thought was unique, is that is create the impression of a very fluid, spontaneous orchestra. Something that you wouldn't expect to find in a concert hall where the members have rehearsed with a conductor for a period of time and there's a set course of action. With the synthesizers and the, the spontaneous orchestra, I was able to present the image of orchestras that can move on the fly and up and down and stop and sounds like they're a very tight knit, but like a school of fish that can move all of a sudden. So how do you get from th this idea of producing these synthesized orchestras to being a guy sitting, you know, in Central Park playing just long musical marathons? Well, the, the electric zither was what I was playing on Central Parks in the plazas in New York. And the zither was a sound with 36 strings. Some of the strings are double and triple. So it created a kind of a choral, chorus kind of effect and a plush, like an orchestra of strings. So uh, I was able to explore that intention through a single instrument, rhythmically and harmonically, and uh, also washes and strums that allow, gave me an instrument to play with. So I could be in my composer, spontaneous composer, conductor, composer mode with a single instrument too. Did you still consider yourself to be a composer in the same sense when you weren't, you know, sitting down and writing notes on paper when you were, you know, sitting in a park and just playing the music spontaneously? I didn't consider myself that much, except Whenever I sat down with the zither, it required finding a tuning. So I composed tunings and tunings I would find an emotional resonance with. Uh, some of them would make me think of a desert or, or ancient civilizations. Well, I would spend time composing the tuning and then I would perform the tuning and the tuning would reveal its mysteries to me. Mountains, valleys, worlds, cosmoses. What does that mean? It was revealing these, these mountains and valleys. Moods. Uh, each tuning, as I play them, you find that uh, inner feelings uh, would evoke images of uh, maybe skies, broad skies. And another time, playing rhythmically, it would invoke images of maybe ancient cultures that w once lived on the planet that were dancing and celebrating and having festivities. Or it might conjure up images of vast stretches of desert land, empty and barren from uh, being uh, drenched by sunlight. These images are maybe because of my sensitivity and my imagination. These are the mountains and valleys. Exploring these tunings would invoke these images, inner images. You're sitting in the park with your eyes closed playing this music, but really you are somewhere else entirely. Yes, uh, but that somewhere else might be in a very concentrated present time. Or uh, with my eyes closed, I was unnecessarily in Washington Square Park or Central Park, but I might have been in a timeless dimension, uh, uh, an, a non-local uh, sense of time and space. Uh, sometimes then I might just be witnessing, like I said, ancient cultures dancing and I'm hovering up above them, watching them. Or I might be soaring over a desert field. 
So my imagination was highly active and still is. And the tuning of the auto harp would be a catalyst for, for driving my, running my imagination in those directions. Sometimes minor modes would take me more in like a feminine contemplative situation and major modes, major tunings on the instrument would take me more of a ecstatic dance, bright, brilliant, celebrative mode of images. Do you use the word imagination? Um, I mean, do, do you get the feeling while some of this is happening that it is pure imagination or, you know, do you believe there might be some form of astral projection happening? Um, I'm always impressed with the term astral projection, but I don't yet feel qualified that I know how to use it. Going out of the body, going out of what we call the third or fourth dimensional physical body, and going into what you call a dream body or the uh, weightless body, and able to experience a different sense of time flow. That I've experienced, and uh, I do, do depend on that when I'm playing for a group that wants to go into meditation or deep relaxation or recording music that I think will be used by energy workers or healers or creative artists, that to use music to transport people, I myself have to experience myself having transport to myself to a location. And then I report on that location through my music. I give uh, coordinates, so I give the emotional uh, experience of being in that altered place or altered scenery. So it's a sense of having been there and giving people the directions for them to actually get there themselves. Yes. Uh, in that case, I've usually felt familiar when people give me a definition of what a shaman is. A shaman goes to other areas within uh, trance or other, other states of consciousness in order to gather information or influence to bring back to the people to uh, guide and inspire the people. So I feel very akin to that picture at times, that I do go into altered states, altered states of present time. And there, there must be times when you sit down and play the zither or play the piano or anything else, and you're not necessarily having that experience. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I say this to somebody who is a very bad meditator. I attempt to meditate and I'm just not, I don't know, for whatever reason I get distracted and I'm just not great at it, but there are some times when it seems to work better than others. Yes, I've had that experience that you just mentioned when I began meditating of being distracted, uh, but I kept my research up and I found guidance that suggested I should do deep breathing exercises before going into meditation. And also I should try to take off all the titles classifications prior to actually going to meditation because the uh, distractions, emotional and psychological distractions, really belong to the titles. And if I relax the titles, I'll find it easier to sit still. I found that to be it's true. Along with one other exercise I did, it took me about a month to master it. And that is how to sit still without fidgeting and keep my eyes focused on a single point in the room. Uh, I found that very challenging uh, not, and not think, you know, to how to sit still and not think. And it would go like, uh, okay, I'm not going to think. Well, there I go thinking. Well, I'm going to stop thinking now. Hey, I'm still thinking. <laughs> and then somewhere, maybe five minutes after all of that, the mind says, hey, this dude's serious. Let, him, let me let him go. And, and then I find out after 21 minutes, I'm in this place that is phenomenal and I'm saying, whoa, this has always been available to me, but I've been too busy with thinking to notice this place. Uh, how is the experience of meditating and this sort of trance-like state you're able to enter playing music? How are those two experiences different? Well, meditation for me is, is to stop leaving the present moment, to stop going somewhere. And what happens is that mind devoid of linear thought, linear content starts to notice itself and it starts to read present time differently than through the filters of thinking mind. And uh, the whole onrush of eternity, the eternal present time becomes clear. I become a very present and clear witness inside of present time. Trans states might be similar, although uh, 
in a trance state, I can go into another character. I can, mm -hmm. like an actor, I can shift mm -hmm. characters and the character can write the songs or write the lyrics through, through me. Or it can report on uh, a specific nature or environmental scenery through me. The trance, uh, still I'm conscious. I'm still conscious, semi-trance. Uh, I've never lost awareness of my body or what I'm doing. I might have done that a couple of times in college under the influence of alcohol. <laughs> but uh, trance and meditation, the, some may uh, debate that they're both in the same, go into deep trance, trance meditation. The two words have been linked together more often than not. So if you say, what's the difference between trance and meditation? Uh, there might be a debate that they're one and the same. Uh, if I say I can put you into a trance with music, it means I could probably put you into a place of uh, an altered state, but you may not in that state be aware of the eternal present moment. You may notice, but you may not be aware of what you're noticing. Uh, meditation, I take as you're aware, you're present, and you're witnessing as I mean, so an enlightened or enlightened or an aware's witness is aha. I am here. I am feeling this eternal presentness. Trance. One might be in a state of altered awareness, but not might not be have a clue of what's going on. And I say, hey, this is interesting. This is groovy. Hey, I'm high. This is fantastic. So being high might be another word for trance, going into an altered state with uh, legal, uh, medically uh, approved substances. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a gift, though, to be able to do that without these substances, right? People spend a lot of time and money trying to get there. I say it is. It's a gift. But, uh, you don't feel like you're obligated, trapped, or uh, addicted. And uh, like you said, if you're out of substance, but you have the will and you have your breath and you have a little bit of discipline, you can almost will yourself into meditation. Yoga practices give us a foundation for that, of how to relax the body, relax the breath, how to choose the focus of your mind so that where your focus is, energy goes. And if you learn how to focus on breath, and maybe even above the physical realm and focus on inner sound current called Nadam. One can shift their sense of uh, selfness from the individual separate self into an expanded sense of the universal oneness self. I've seen the phrase sound vision ascribed to you. What, what, what do those words mean together? Sound vision, if you heard the term uh, vision quest, when you go on a vision quest is when you leave your familiar surroundings and you go out with a shaman or a spiritual leader and you leave your clothes and your belongings somewhere and you're given a blanket and you go up to a mountain and you sit for a day or two without, with the minimum, no food, maybe a little bit of water until you meet an expanded awareness of what's calling you to to do with your, with your life and you get this vision very clear uh, it may not be a sentence it may not it may be a picture it may be a total feeling um and that you come down from the vision quest with this sense of what you're supposed to be doing with your life and directions you're supposed to take well 1974 i had been vision questing without using the term vision questing and i was researching using experimental approaches substances Tai Chi and different spiritual practices. And on one particular night before going into deep meditation practice, I was found myself immersed in this musical hearing experience of music I'd never heard before. Even more than that, music hearing in a way that I've never heard or used my uh, hearing faculty before. And that is not hearing sound that was traveling from some external place to my ears, but hearing sound as if I was an infinite medium, aware of myself vibrating eternally. On 
this is a nonlinear vision. This gave me a sense of, wow, what am I going to do with this? And I couldn't think of playing music because this music is not played. It had no beginning or ending. It couldn't be written down. It couldn't be recorded. A day or two after that vision, I didn't call it a vision. I just call it, whoa. <laughs> I went to the libraries to start researching for anything that would point to that experience. And I found there was quite a bit from different spiritual cultures pointing to that experience. Music of the spheres, cosmic sound, current, uh, Shabda, Shabda, Yoga, Shabda Yoga, and Nadam. And there was even a scientific study on the kinds of experiences one could have. And one of them zeroed in on what I heard, like brass choir. Brass choirs, this timeless orchestra of brass instruments. And so that vision gave me a new sense of direction of where I wanted to go as a musician composer, not knowing how I would accomplish it on this side of that veil. But it, I found out that it informed the kind of music that I allowed to come through me. And it formed, it allowed me to let go of old uh, restrictions and learned uh, attitudes about music, what music had to be. Like music, I learned that music had to have a, an official beginning, a middle and an ending. This sound vision showed me that the present moment is the whole story, that there's no ending or beginning. And so I, it compelled me to reach for a music that wasn't involved with having a beautiful beginning or beautiful ending, but a music that suggests the eternal present moment, a sustained present time. It's also uh, a vision that showed me that uh, the sound is everywhere and that when I perform, that I'm not necessarily bringing this music to anyone, but I'm pointing to the music where you already are and have already been. So it's, uh, uh, this vision showed me a way out of the old mindset of what music, especially classical music, should be in order to be acceptable. So when you're playing music, are you manifesting that sound? Are you chasing that inner sound? I mean, you sort of alluded to the fact earlier that you can't necessarily capture that sound. Right. I think my nervous system, my psych, my psyche has been imprinted by that experience. And so it may have ordained me as an ambassador of nonlinear sound. And so it, uh, I can't really um, make, make, make that music. And I don't hope to, but if I perform for an audience, I can prepare them after the music has subsided to go into a deeper space of release from uh, the thinking mind. To so and it's, it, it can point to that place. But it, I cannot. I don't hope to make that music. Uh, I might allude to it. I might prepare listeners by treating them to a different way of hearing music instead of listening to it as an external event to immerse them. That event did teach me the power of immersion experience, of baptizing someone in the sound, of immersing them in the sound where they're not listening to it, but they're feeling themselves with their boundaries dissolved and they're an open flowing space. When you say you can't hope or maybe don't hope to create it, is it, is it because it's, it's physically impossible for you to do or just that you have different objectives? I'd say that that music is not of the physical realm. It's nonlinear and that I don't hope to make it with a physical instrument. It's already going on uh, by itself. It has no ending or beginning. It's an uncaused, unstruck sound. Uh, I did fantasize about the idea of maybe standing in the presence of an audience without a musical instrument, closing my eyes, and somehow going into a deep enough of a, tr of a trance that was contagious enough to cause everyone around me to have an internal immersion experience that corresponds to what I'm experiencing. That's the closest I've imagined myself being able to share that experience. Is it music in any practical sense or is that just the easiest word you can use to describe what the phenomenon is? 
music is always comfortable. Some teachers have chosen to use the word pulsation or vibration, and that uh, depending on where I or the subject is in their spiritual unfoldment, they will have the experience, different experience. Some may just hear it as crickets or bees or a ringing sound. And I guess because of my compositional uh, background at that time, I might have just intuitively understood it in terms of a brass orchestra. I heard it as a very strong uh, symphonic experience. You contextualize things through music, so that's how you're able to to understand it is through these pre-existing ideas of what you have about music. Yes, I'm allowing that to be the case, Brian. How has your sense of time changed over the years? Dramatically. Um, I Years ago, I might have been concerned with and uh, focusing on the future. What am I going to do with the future? Years from now, five-year plan, eternity. I mean, will I make it to 80 or 90 years of age? My sense of time now is to prioritize the present moment and become immersed in present time and become a connoisseur of present time. And that the, uh, the walls of the past and future, yesterday and tomorrow, have fallen away and, and the now sort of spills over into what used to be the past and in the future and it's just an expanded present time. So my sense of time has shifted in since I prioritize present timeness and uh, not getting bent out of shape about future or past. Have you experienced music in the world from other people that you feel like, th that it's clear to you that they're maybe channeling so something similar or that they're, they're having a similar experience and they're trying to translate a similar experience as one you're having? Yes, that happens with an artist named Sylvia Nakash. Is a female who lives in California who does a lot of trance, meditative, altered state kind of music, and she's heavily knowledge the science of, of music and sound. And another artist, Yasos, lives on the West Coast or in Hawaii. His music uh, invites my imagination to avoid future and past and remain in present time. Those two. There was the music of Yasso's when he performed with Stephen Halpern on something called Spectrum Suite back in the late 70s. And then I first heard that music. It inspired me to consider putting more of my energies into this direction of sustained present time, flowing, uh, many even call it drifting, drifting in the sense of not in a hurry to get to the future or get away from the past, but savoring and, and in contemplating, contemplating the present time. When you first experienced the music of Brian Eno, or when you first met and worked with Brian Eno, did you get a sense that he was on a similar path as you? When I met him, I was not really aware of his music and not fully aware of who he was. Few people had tried to advise me to check out his music and the music with which he collaborated with Robert Fripp. I didn't have time to check that out before he left me a note in Washington Square Park one evening while I was busking. And uh, I responded to the note. Next day we hooked up at his uh, residence in the village and he talked about many things and he brought up the subject of ambient. And it sounded like it was related to what I was doing or it related to what he thought I was capable of doing in studio. And we agreed to go into a studio and record. Even up to that point, I was unaware of what his music was. I had not heard his music. He didn't try to push his music on me. So after the album was released and I started hearing my music in the context of his other ambient music, and it felt like unrushed music, like an environment within which to be present, to think if you wanted to think, but it wasn't uh, future or past oriented music. So when you were sitting in Central Park or Washington Square Park creating this music, did you have a sense that there was, that there were artists out there creating something similar? I was only aware of Yasos and Stephen Halpern, uh, not of other artists. I had been uh, made aware of 
artists who were doing uh, their own version of meditation, trance, mind travel, music. One was from Florida, I've forgotten his name. So artists were starting to contact me and letting me know of their existence. I would get invited to expos and new age ex conferences. And I would meet up with art artists who were doing, were going in that same intention with their instrument, whether it was a Celtic harp or flute or guitar or didgeridoo. And I would hear them reaching outside of the box of, uh, of top 40 <laughs> music. Was it a sense of, of relief when you realized that you weren't the only one out there? It was. Uh, it was supportive. And at the same time, the nature of my music was generated from my experience with meditation and reaching in to touch the source. And once I felt this intimate communion with source, it was no longer, uh, I didn't feel lonely in a negative way. Um, I felt totally satisfied, secure, and uh, whether I had external support or not, but the audiences loved it. And the people, the random audiences in the park and the uh, spiritual conferences, they gave me the support even though I uh, hadn't met a whole herd of alternative music artists. When do you realize that you have uh, a, a kindred spirit or somebody who you're actually able to actively collaborate on music with? Well, there's one person, um, Jonathan Goldman. He was living in Maine at the time and I connected with him at a, a conference and weekend retreat he made me aware that he was aware of my music and that he he was leaving jazz and rock and punk music and he wanted to go in its direction and he suggested that we collaborate and our collaboration there was uh, evidence that he had this direction in him all the time but didn't have an outlet for it so our collaboration provided him with an outlet that might have been my first collaboration 1982 where uh, we uh, were like focusing in the same direction for an alternative music form. Do you get, get a sense that part of your role in all of this is to be a teacher, to kind of guide people down that path? Yes, uh, even if it's just to model to someone who's passing by and sees it and, and it clicks and they just go on, never meeting again, but they've been giving the go ahead sign or the permission to explore that direction. Other people who have listened to my music for years, and I felt by their own testimony that they have been inspired to uh, lend themselves in their own inner direction that's aligned with where I'm going. So I'm, I'm aware of that there are people around the planet who let me know that music has inspired them to reach for their own inner vision with more passion. So what's kept you in New York all of these years? Well, I don't want to own a car, the food. I like walking. Practical reasons. Yeah, but I like walking on the streets in New York. New York is a fine walking town. Uh, I like dancing, and New York offers a lot of alternative dance situations. The rent here is pretty good. Sometimes I, I'm wondering if my years of performing on the sidewalks of Brooklyn and New York, a spirit guide of New York says, okay, I like this person. I'm going to make life comfortable for him here. So I received good rent. Life has been pretty tolerable, manageable here. Uh, the transportation system is beautiful. Like I said, I don't really want to own a car. Uh, the wide variety of ethnic groups, tolerant, ethnic tolerance here. And New York has great weather. After traveling around the world for years, I've learned to really appreciate New York's sunny weather. All of the summer, this is the first summer that I've really had a chance to really note that New York is humid in the summer. I'm usually touring, and I didn't realize this. I travel around the world, and people say, how can you be in New York? It's so humid. And I said, what are you talking about? <laughs> but uh, I like the weather in New York. A lot of clear skies, and uh, I like the change of seasons. 
Yeah, you, you might be the first person I've spoken to who, who cited rent and weather as being reasons for staying in New York. <laughs> those, are, those are usually complaints that people have when, when they're out here. I have great rent. Do you find that a place as chaotic as New York is a difficult setting for being able to tap into some of these ideas of sound vision? It is a challenging place, but you can find it in New York and you can lose it in New York. I find that my one requirement of the last years of living in New York is that I live near Central Park because I use the parks a lot. I danced a lot before the, uh, this health situation came up. Dancing, meditative dancing, dancing in general is a way of maintaining my uh, countenance. Uh, meditation, stillness. I, I live alone and stillness is very convenient. Chose a diet that's supportive of me not having belly aches and headaches. So my lifestyle choices have been my answer to how do you live in New York? And my general answer is I'm not just living in New York. I'm living in an infinite, peaceful, serene cosmos. And that I stay in touch with that and I bring that to the table so that it balances what the outer world is handing on me. So I balance that with knowing what the source allows me to know about myself through meditation through my inner work. Do you find though that it, it it's more conducive to what you want to do creatively than, you know, going and living in the middle of the forest, for example? Oh, I balance it with, I do, I used to, before this situation came up, go up to an ashram in New York, uh, in Harriman, New York, which had lots of wooded area. And I would go there and hang out in the woods, just go and stand and contemplate. So that was my uh, balancing factor. And I found that necessary and yummy. Now I can do it in some parts of Central Park through the rambles or through the, and uh, it is necessary to get away from the me mechanized en energy and get away from people who are, uh, might be in an anxiety hustling mode. I also, what allows me to live in New York is that I have double pane windows, so I'm able to quiet some of the sound but uh it is a challenge without meditation that the city itself will take away your a focus and uh, you will probably require to get away to a more serene uh, nature do you get a sense that the current moment is having a marked effect on the music you create it is in the sense that as i do reference the news daily to get a sense of what's impacting people on a global level. And so it's like a statement that I once heard Leonard Bernstein said that when times become more outrageous, then the artists should become more outrageous with their service. So this time has impacted me and helped me to decide to become more committed with allowing my music to be more transportive and more passionate and to engage the listener in a way that helps them to remain balanced, centered, and find peace within themselves with the support of this music. I was reading an interview that you were doing ahead of this current trilogy of, of albums, and you seemed like you were perhaps a little bit hesitant to get back to the piano. Why was that? The zither allowed me to move around the world in remote places where there was no piano, and I could quality control my sound uh, the idea of depending on uh, a, the condition of a piano wherever I perform, well, I didn't think I was ready to make that those kind of demands. And secondly, I felt like my improvisational piano wasn't as exotic and as different and as new agey as the sound of the zither. Electric zither, I felt, was an instant meditation, an instant unfamiliar sound. So it punctuated the... Uh, the feeling of new age, new sound hearing experience. I've always loved the piano whenever I would travel on touring. If there was a piano, even backstage, I would win my way to it and play it. But about three years ago, this happened in San Francisco at the lab. There was a piano on stage. And as the stage hands were seeking to clear the stage for my performance, I suggested them leave the piano there and I involved it in my concert, which was recorded. And that was heard by Matthew Jones at Warp Records, who eventually suggested 
you know, I like that piano thing you do. Why don't we think of doing an album of piano? And I said, ah, oh, this is the window I've been waiting for to finally let the piano happen. Do you find now that you, you've been back at it again that you're able to reach similar places on the piano as the zither? Yes, um, the piano, I can change harmonic feels instantly. And the piano has something that the zither doesn't have. It has very committed deep bass, the, the round deep bass. And I, I found myself for years trying to get more bass out of the zither, but it just didn't work unless I had did some trick effects on it. Also, the piano allowed me to dance. I move like a move when I'm at the piano. So the piano allowed me a full range of uh, uh, emotion and the interaction, the physical, what do you call it, tactile interaction with the piano is fuller than with the zither. I can't help but think of Thelonious Monk when you describe yourself dancing at the piano. You would stand up and sort of spin around. Yes. Is that a sense of joy that makes you get up and dance around as you're playing? Oh, uh, well, you know, the music might be an outgrowth of dancing. I love to dance and, and uh, the idea of the body, playing the body, which is playing the instrument, like it's a total connect, rather than the body just stay stiff while trying to get the piano to dance. I think just getting piano, the body becomes one with the piano. So I'm playing the body, moving the piano, and um, what my fingers do on the keyboards is an extension of what I'm feeling through the body. Letting the feeling affect the body as well as through the keyboard. 